There we go. I will begin. I will begin with a word of prayer. Ahem. 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 Dear Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, I thank you uh, for these students. Let's pray that you be with us today. Help us to glorify you what we do and just to understand a little bit more about your creation today, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, so let us work a problem. Is there a, any uh, particular kind of problem you'd like to see worked? Anybody? Yes, sir. I don't know what that means. I mean, you can ask me, like, what, what kind of problem do you want me to work, though? That, that problem 35 is not a kind of problem. Oh, the, the, the two, you're, you're asking about the two pulley problem? So, um, sure. So here's a table, right? And we can put a couple pulleys on that. One here and one here, right? And um, let's see here. I can connect mass in the middle mass over here and then um, mass like that right and this maybe this is M1 M2 M3 yeah and um, in the interest of this problem not taking too long, I'll say this t table is frictionless, yeah? Ah, we can, let's throw friction, friction into the mix. Why not? Why not? So, um, friction. Why not? Why not? So, let's suppose that um, mu uh, equals to 0 0.5 is the coefficient of static friction, right? And um, let's take it from there. How do you set up this problem? So we're assuming that the, the, the pulleys are essentially massless, the string doesn't stretch, right? Um, so what I would do is we look at, um, you know, Newton's uh, second law on each mass. And um, I'll start by defining acceleration positive like this, just for the sake of, you know, discussion. So if you like, we can work under the assumption that M3 is a large mass and it's going to pull these two that way, right? Just for the sake of discussion here. And um, so what are the, what are the uh, forces at play in each mass, right? So we can draw the free body diagram in each case. And when we do that, we've got, um, ugh, hideous, um, M1G acting down here. You got the tension force acting up. This, the string does not stretch. So we've got the same tension force over here acting that away, right? Now that's a totally different string, so it doesn't have to have the same tension. So let me call this T1 actually. Over here, on the other side of things, we've got T2. T2 would go this away. And again, it would be acting up here. And we also have um, M3G on over here. We've got uh, force of gravity down. And um, let's see what else is going on. Well, on the top mass, on M2 here, we, we also have what? We have, and by, by the way, guys, I've, um, I've decided to uh, change my ways, change my evil ways. And I will no longer be denoting just a big N here. I'm going to use F sub N for normal. I was using N before because 
some book I had was using n for the normal force. I was trying to like match the book. And, but let's just be more logical and say f sub n is the normal force. That way we don't have the issue of Newton equals the force. I mean, there's a confusion there. So f sub n for normal force. And the force of gravity, well, it's just m2g, right? Now, my, my picture is not to scale because the thing you should be able to see from this immediately is that because it's on the plane, right, we see that the normal force has to be equal to m2g, right? Do we agree? Those have to, ma those have to balance out because there's the, 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 you know, the, uh, the middle mass is not accelerating off the table, right? Okay, so what are the interesting, the interesting Newton's laws? We've got three of them. We have m1. m1a equals to t1. Uh, minus M1G. We have M2A. Oh, and I haven't pictured something, right? Friction, right? So now this is, this is where maybe I get into trouble in terms of the asymmetry of M3 being larger than M1. Um, so I'm a little bit, uh, let me just confess, I'm assuming that M3 is, let's just for the sake of um, discussion, say much, much larger than M1 and M2, and that, and that, in that situation, it's clear the motion is going to be that way. All right. There, of course, are more interesting problems where you don't know ahead of time which way it's going to go. Is it going to sit still? Is it going to slide? You can, you know, study the static force of friction. Is the, you know, tension large enough in principle to move the body? We could work a problem like that. Let's see here. So. That's, uh, right now I'm assuming that M3 is large enough that it's moving, so we just, and I say static here, but I really should just say kinetic because that's what I'm thinking about. Um, okay, so M2A, yeah, so where is the force of friction? Well, force of friction is this way, right? Force of friction is opposite the motion. So let's see here, A is positive this way, so I've got T2 minus the force of friction, right? But what is the force of friction? Let's get to it. It's mu k times m2g, right? In this case, that's it. And what's my third Newton's law? My third Newton's law, m3 a equals to what? Um, well, uh, m3g is down. That's the positive sense by my definition, minus t2. So that's how you'd set this problem up, and then you can solve those three equations and three unknowns to find the acceleration and such. Yeah? Why would you not also subtract uh, T1 and T2? Oh, thank you. Um, let's see here. On M2, I lost, I lost track of what I was doing, didn't I? So I, um, I also need to subtract T, T1. Thank you. So let's fix that. So minus T1. Very good question. Excellent question. Thank you. Oh. That's there, isn't it? Let's see here. So um, I think if you add all three of these equations, nice stuff happens, right? Just add all of the equations. What do you get? You get m1 plus m2 plus m3 times a equals to what? Well, you see what happens when we add? The t1s be canceling. The t2s be canceling. And what are you left with? Minus m1g um, plus m3g. And in the middle, you pick up this minus mu k m2 g, like that. And then you can find the acceleration, right? I'll make one more step. Just to, let's talk about if it makes sense. Let's talk about if the formula makes sense or not, right? So you got um, m3 minus m1 minus mu k m2 divided by the sum of the masses. And that all gets multiplied by g. I think that makes sense. Um, if you can imagine um, M3 being much larger than, mem if you really think about this, if mass 3 is really colossally larger than mass 1 and mass 2, this formula just collapses to G. The mass 3 is essentially in free fall. That makes sense. On the flip side of things, if in fact the mass of 1 and 2 is comparable to 3, this will get much smaller. That also kind of makes sense. And and then, of course, you could think about wh what's the, um, what would make it stop? What, what, how much of mass 1 and 2 do you need to make this stop accelerating, for it to balance out? What do you need? You need 
that M3 is equal to um, M1 plus mu k M2. So if you, if you pick a mass 1 and mass 2 whose sum together balances out mass 3 like that, then it wouldn't even, wouldn't even fall, right? There's that balance that anytime you get that much mass, then it ceases to move. And anyway, this is totally unhelpful for the problem you asked about. Yeah, so <laughs> I will have pity on you and, and, and draw some things. So for that two-pulley problem that you're actually asking about, this one, right? <laughs> that, that's roughly it, right? So, um, some critical thoughts here. One is, there's, there's, there's a couple of really big things that you need to make sure, this is M1, right? So I'm not going to solve the problem for you, I'm just going to give you some, some pointers. Is that, first of all, do I have it labeled correctly? Is that one and two? All right. So, observation number one, and this is different than most of the problems we've made. The acceleration of one and the acceleration of two are not the same, right? So A1, so this, this has acceleration, you know, A1, and this has acceleration A2, let's say. A1 is not equal to A2, unless they both happen to be zero, I suppose. Otherwise, they're not equal. You have to think through how they related. You can figure it out if you think about how the string pulls around the pulley and how the motions, the motions are related, they're just not the same. That's number one, all right? The other thing to be concerned about is the tension is a little bit sneaky. So you, if we think about this pulley right here, right? This is massless, essentially massless pulley. And so if I, if I was doing this right, that should be pictured at the top of the pulley, right? Um, <clears throat> so there's this one string which wraps around, maybe I should put it a different color even. So there's a black string like this, and then the other pulley has, let's say, the red string, they don't have the same tension. They're, they're different strings. But just because they don't have the same tension doesn't mean the tensions aren't related. They are related, they have to be. See, because if you think about conceptually this pulley, right, you can think about it having a, a um, well just think about the pulley, right? The net force on that pulley has to be zero, otherwise what? If the net force on the pulley isn't zero, it would mean that that pulley is tearing apart, is what it would mean. So, if this is the tension in this string, right, then that tension is also pulling here like this, right? It's massless, right? So there's no, no, there's no normal force, essentially. It's just horizontal. So what does the tension in the other string have to be, if that tension's T? Think about it. There has to be a tension of T over 2 on the top and a tension of T over 2 on the bottom. In order to get tension T, in order to get net force T pu pulling to the left, balanced by net force T moving to the right. So that, that's how you have to think about this problem. Once you have that connection, that's the connection between the tension and the rope around the pulley on the table and the tension on the rope hanging over. That's the, they're related, they're not equal. Once you know that, and you also know that there's a formula we could write here. How are they related? Someone who's already figured it out and wants to be kind and share it with the others, you're welcome to. What is it? It's a half. It's a half? Which way? A1 is a half A2? Or you could say A2 is what? 2A1? <coughs> I think I believe that. I hope you're right, because I, I... Those who thought about it, do you agree? Yeah. All right, cool. So then what do you do? You write Newton's law, Newton's second law in M1 and M2 and do the algebra, and you can work it out. That's it. So... If you thought this problem was hard, I agree. I also think it's hard. 
Yeah. Another example I should work is something like this, where we have different angle on different sides, maybe 30 degrees over here, maybe 50 degrees over here. My picture, of course, isn't quite right. And suppose you've got, you know, pulley up here, and um, you've got a box on one side, and you've got a box on the other side, all right? <clears throat> all right, and um, let's say that the uh, coefficient of static friction is 0 0.8, and the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0 0.4, all right? And um, let's say that this is mass M. L let me say it this way. This is M1. I always regret writing. M1 is here and M2 is over here, okay? And let's suppose that M2 is equal to, you know, um, 3 times M1. Then my question is this. Does it move? Or does it stay put? That's the setup. Does the system um, stay at rest? Or does it accelerate? Non-trivially. Which is just a fancy math term for saying not zero, <laughs> non-trivial. There we go. And um, so, okay, so what do we do? Again, I'm assuming that the pulley is massless, that the rope doesn't stretch, all right? You're like, are we ever going to assume that the pulley is not massless? Oh, yes, we will. When we get to rotational motion, we'll give pulleys masses. And we can deal with that when we talk about rotational dynamics, torque, and all that, all right? So we, we do get to that later in this course. The strings never stretch, though. Sorry about that. Um, oh, well. Maybe there's an engineering course somewhere with stretchy strings. Is, is there? Did you guys ask in, like, college for a weekend when you came here, like, do you have any courses on stretchy strings? I need to know. That's how I'm going to base whether I come to the school or not. No? Nobody? Nobody cares? All right. Hey, do you guys know about the, uh, the Papagallo? Papagallo in the mall? None of you, uh, isn't it Gallo? Guy, what is it? Papagallo? Is that referring to a There's a restaurant in the mall. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Say again? Papagallo. What he said. So, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so we went there this weekend, and uh, it's, I mean, it's very pretty, right? I mean, so if you want to impress a, a date or something, like if you kind of ignore the people out in the, in the mall wandering about, the ambiance is really striking. But uh, my wife's like, ooh, Mexican street corn, I want to try that. So I'm like, okay. So I, so I got her the Mexican street corn, and then... So yeah, just don't. Um, so like, I don't know, it's like $7, but how much does the can of corn cost in Walmart now? Was it maybe two? Like, so it, that's, I, I think from what I can tell, it's like a can of corn and then like a little bit of like cheesy stuff sprinkled and some kind of cream sauce and then they put it on this sort of artisanal um, cutting board thing and it's all in this like ceramic Gravy pouring deal, yeah. Eat what's that? Oh, oh yes. Well, well. So my wife was disappointed because when she said when it was called Mexican street food, you think of something you could eat on the street. Who would carry, uh, you know, a spoon and a thing to eat in like this, right? I mean, so what my wife was hoping for, and she's done some googling. There's apparently two schools of thought on this. The one is like we had in the restaurant. The other is sort of like a roasted, yeah, uh, corn on the cob, which is what, what she was hoping for. So that was 
that was kind of disappointing. And then the other thing is they, they make you pay money for the chips there. Oh, yeah, you gotta, you gotta buy your, you gotta buy your chips and salsa. What's that about? Now I will say, we had the, we had the, the uh, mocajete lava flow, and it was, it was all right. I mean, it was pretty good. They had some kind of spicy cheese and stuff. But I will tell you this. I should tell you, this is my service to you. Some of you are new to Lynchburg, give or take a year, um, or two maybe. You know already. There's another restaurant, there's another Mexican restaurant in town on the other side of Wards Road, right? Over there? Over there? I don't know where we are. That way. Um, so it's called La Carreta. And the food is very similar in taste in terms of spices, but it's, you can get the chips for free there. And the service is better, so. <laughs> and also, you don't have to go to the mall. So it's, I think it's a win-win-win. But um, anyway, I don't think I'm going back, back to the one in the mall. It's, it's too fancy for me. Um, but anyway. So I'm sorry. I seem to be wasting your time. But um, <clears throat> that'll happen sometimes, you know. So here, we got the force of the normal on two. Over here, you got the force of the normal on one. What else is at play? Well, you got your, uh, you got your M1G cos theta, cosine 30, right? M1G cosine 30 here. And on, on this guy over here, you got your M2G cosine 50. Ah, I should have made this thing bigger. Sorry. And then what else, what else is at play? Ten, yeah, tension, very good. And the tension, this one's easier, right? Because there's just one rope and there's just one tension to think about. So you got tension that way, tension this way, same tension. And let's see here, what, what was the situation? M2 is equal to 3M1, right? So if there is motion, which way is it going? It's going to the, yeah, that way, right? So let's, let's define, just for the sake of naturalness, define A to be positive that way. And that means that if there, if there is to be, if the, you know, the force of friction is opposing the motion, which direction, the potential motion, I should say, at the start, it's going where, which way? Force of friction's gotta be this way then, right? So let me say force of friction on one. There's also a force of friction on two, right? Over here. So, Let's work it out. So first of all, what's the, what are the normal forces? We can figure that out now. Fn1 is equal to what? That one's going to be m1 g cosine 30, yeah? And what's the force, what's the normal force on n2? M, yeah, m2 g cosine 50. All right, great. Now what else? I'm going to um, erase the complicated problem and, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I, in, in past times I've taught physics, every so often I'll assign a, a, a vertical block and tackle problem with like three pulleys. It just, <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> There are people who are like just walked, just, just, just can solve those problems easily. I am not one of them. Like something about like multiple pulleys messes with my brain. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so here we go. Those are the normal forces. That means we know the force of friction, right? So the force of friction one is equal to what in magnitude? Um, you know, we're hoping for the static case. So we're going to say 0 0.8, right? Times M1 g cos 30. And the force of friction on 2, what's it going to be? 0 0.8. And we're assuming the static case, right? Well, maybe I should really put a mu here, but uh, I'll just find m2g, where was I? Cosine 50. So there's, there's your forces of friction. And then what do I do? I want to write Newton's law in the parallel direction to the plane, right? So I've got M1A, what's it equal to? 
listen, you're like, I thought you're looking for it to be in equilibrium, right? I thought you're looking for it to be static. Why don't you write zero there? The reason I'm not writing zero there is simply this. I'm preparing for the eventuality it's not. See, if I take this approach, if we find out that we can't attain a zero here from balancing the forces, no problem. We're already ready to attack the question of what the acceleration is, you know? So we've already got this set up. So M1A is what? It's T, right? Minus what? T minus the force of friction one, which is equal to 0 0.8. Um, and I, I debate whether I should put, put like a mu there instead of the 0.8, but anyway, I'll stick with it. G cosine 30. And um, I don't feel like you need it. I don't feel like, I don't, sometimes I don't feel like you need a, a, a microphone in this room, except that there's somebody using a microphone next door. <laughs> And then, like, I just keep hearing it, you know? I don't know about you guys, but... Ah. Okay, then what? M2A is what? Did I miss anything? Yeah? Would you consider, would you use the, like, uh, the sign of 30? No? Why would I do that? Oh! Yeah! See, this this all this talk of... Uh, the restaurant I'm mispronouncing the name of, um, Papagayo. <laughs> oh, that was right? Yeah. Oh. So if I, if I try to mispronounce it, it, gets, it comes out right. Okay, well, good. Then, um, so, let's see here. Yes, we need to, we, I, you, you, I've, I've ignored half of gravity, right? That's not good. Yeah. So we also got what? So this one is what? This one is M1. G sine 50, and over here, you got your M2 G sine 50, right? Don't forget those. Oh, yeah, that should be 30. Thank you. Of course, all these mistakes are intentional for your learning. You're welcome. Let's see here. So um, M1A is, so we, we do we subtract or add this dude? Subtract. subtract, yeah. So minus M1G sine 30. Sine of 30 is 0 0.5, right? So I'll put that in. And M2A is what? Um, so we've got, what's at play over there? So M2G sine 50 is downward. That's the positive direction. I'll start with that one. M2G sine 50. And then what? Minus the tension force. Right? And then what? Subtract the friction, right? And that would be f the other one. So minus 0 0.8 M2G cosine 50 degrees. All right. So we, we have everything. Have we double checked our, we haven't missed any forces like I, I did a second ago. Good. Then, um, are we interested in the tension? No, right? So, you want to do algebra to eliminate the tension. How do you do that? What, what algebra should we do here? Yeah, add the two equations. So, more often than not, <laughs> that's a good move with these problems. Just add the equations. We get M1 plus M2A times A is equal to what you got here. Um, you know, minus 0 0.8 M1 cosine 30 minus M1G um, plus M2, no G there, just minus M1. Oh, man. <sighs> Sorry. So we have minus 0, I'm going to factor the G out, minus 0 0.8 cosine 30 times M1 um, minus 0 0.5 M1, right? Um, plus M2 sine 50 and minus 0 0.8 M2 cosine 50, right? 
all of that multiplied by g, there you go. So let's see, what did we say about m1 and m2? m2 was what? Three M one, right? So we can rewrite this. This is actually M one G times what? Minus zero point eight cosine of thirty degrees minus zero point five um, plus three times the sine of fifty minus zero point eight times three cosine 50. And what does that work out to? Do, 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 minus point eight. Ooh. Ooh. So what did you guys get for all this? Anybody? Negative That is also what I got. What does that mean? And of course the units here, well there are no units, that's, that's it, you know. So we have the acceleration is what? Um, M1g times minus 0 0.437 divided by what? M1 plus M2 is what? It's, it's just 4M1, right? So the acceleration is, and, and it's, this is, now is this a legitimate acceleration? I mean, it's not. Why, why, why do I say it's not? This is, this is negative, right? What does that mean? That, <laughs> that, that means that it's going this way, right? Which means the directions that we gave to the friction are no longer physically reasonable, which means we can't really trust this answer. But what this tells us, though, is that... <clears throat> um, what does this tell us? What do you think? That friction goes the other way. Hmm. There's more than enough friction. Well, we've assumed, I mean, by writing this, right, by writing the, these terms here, um, excuse me, by writing these terms with the point eight, We've assumed maximum friction force, right? This is like the maximum static friction force that you can get, right? And um, so I'm pretty sure what this means is it's sliding. So what do we do then? So how do you solve it? Well, what you do is, let's see here. I th that's weird. I would have thought that 3M2, I thought 3M1 would be enough to make it go that way. This doesn't make sense to me. I feel like there's a mistake. Hmm. Let me step back from this for a second. I mean, that's not physically reasonable, right? 
Think about this. Does that, is that a physically reasonable result? Yes, sir. Right. So the way to think about this is that we, we don't, right, we're not actually, in this, in this case, we're not applying the maximum friction force. That's the, that's the solution to this seeming conundrum. Is we've assumed that the maximum friction force is applied, but it's not the case, right? In fact, you can need, you, you know, we don't have to have the full 0.8 times the normal force to balance these out, right? <laughs> In fact, let's see here. Um, but that's, I mean, that's, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. My point is we know something, uh, what I wanted to say is we know something's wrong, just uh, on face value, because the assumption of this problem is that mass two is heavier than mass one, right? So if there is motion, you don't have the heavier masses <laughs> going up the ramp being pulled by the lighter mass that direction, right? That's, that's well, not what happens, right? It would depend on the angle, because at the shallower angle, shallower angle was under the heavier mass, it is possible that the heavier mass is Right, but this is the opposite of that, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I totally agree. If, if, the, uh, if the situation were reversed and, and more severe in the direction you're saying, it, it's possible, right? But, um, let's see here, so what to say? Um, So I suppose the simplest thing to say in this situation is, in fact, we are at rest, right? And um, well, I, I think that's kind of it. Once you get to this point, you're like, so therefore, intuitively, it follows we're at rest. Now, if you then ask the follow-up question, what is the force of friction, right? What's the force of friction keeping this motionless? How would you figure that out? Yeah. Um, you could assume the self acceleration is zero, I think. Yes, right? But then, but okay, great. So what, what equations will we solve to figure out the force of friction necessary to keep this motionless? Yeah. Yeah, uh, exactly. So same equations. We put the left-hand side zero. Caleb? Yeah, yeah so Caleb, Caleb's saying put these to zero. I think Sam is telling us to put this here and this here. Instead of maxing it out, just say that's the force of friction on one, right? And this is the force of friction on two. And I think we'll just be up against this system of equations. Zero is equal to the tension, we still don't know, minus the force of friction on one, minus, uh, you know, 0 0.5 m1g. And then the other equation, zero is equal to m2g sine of 50 um, minus t, um, minus the force of friction on two. I'm assuming, of course, that the directions that we gave to the friction are still reasonable. I think that is the case. I think those are the reasonable directions for the force of frictions to be realized, right? And then, okay, well then you've got, <laughs> then there's still something missing, isn't there? <laughs> uh, huh. You're like, how do you know there's something missing? Well, we've got two equations and three unknowns. That's not a good thing. The new mu? Say again? But mu, mu, the mu's are given. Yeah, that's, that's the maximum, right? I mean, so the force of friction that we don't know is, um, like force of friction one is less than or equal to mu sub s times the normal force on n one. I mean that's that's the fundamental concept of the force of friction is it maxes out at that value. So I think there's like some other. You can assume that the force of friction is the same material because you get in the mu of them, so then you have to break down fire and you can replace mass two in force of friction two. Oh. 
yes. That's, there you go. That's the other equation I'm missing. Thank you, perfect. So his point is that these relate the force of frictions because we know that M2 is what? Um, three, what was it? Actually, wait a minute. Ooh, I'm not sure we can say that actually. Not, I, I, that, I, I wanted to believe, but now I think about it for a second. I'm not sure. I want to believe. Hmm. Well, M2 is 3M1 anyway, so definitely the maximum fa forces of static friction are, are related, but I don't know. I'm not, so, I'm not so convinced that the same proportionate not max value, I, I'm not, I'm, what I'm trying to say is it might well be that we um, only need 30% of the max over here and 50% of the max over here. Like I don't see that those should actually be the same. So, I don't know guys, I'm stuck at the moment. So. Ah, rats. I want to talk to you guys about another problem actually. So, yes sir. No, but because the motion is zero because there's a force of friction keeping it from moving, so we can't ignore it. Well, yes, but that's what we're trying to figure out. What is that force of friction? Um, what about the tension? What's that? See, I mean, that's the problem is we don't know tension either. Do, add what together? Add M1. I mean, that's what we did here. So you're, but, but I mean, we can't just ignore friction. It's there. I mean, <laughs> if, yeah, I mean, if, if there was no friction, we could figure out the tension in that case. Sure. Would that be the same tension as when there is friction, though? No, the tension would cancel. I don't disagree. I mean, but. OK, so the last problem I want to talk about today, and I'm just going to set it up because, you know, I spent too long on this one. My bad. There is a problem like this with numbers that works out logically. So, you know, this is the issue is anytime there's like a static versus kinetic deciding whether or not it moves is much more complicated than you might think at first glance. As you can see, I have, you know, talked myself into something at the moment. I'll figure it out and tell you guys next class probably. But um, so here's here's a problem. Suppose you've got a, uh, I don't know, flying monkey. All right. And um, you put your flying monkey. I don't know about right here. All right, so imagine that this is a flying monkey, all right, right here. And let's suppose that the, uh, well, let's suppose that the, uh, the origin's over there in the corner, right? So you had a flying monkey. I'll draw a picture of the situation over here. Put our flying monkey right here. And it's evil, of course. Flying evil monkey right there. And it's where where is that? I don't know. It's about like maybe two meters in the X and five meters in the Y, and it's about a meter up, right? So that's at <coughs> two, five, um, one in meters, right? And um, of course the flying monkey is going to try to bite you. So you need to like immobilize it using drones with grappling hooks which you have an ample supply of. So you have, 
let's suppose you have, you know, three grappling hook drones that have already um, put their hooks into the flying monkey. And um, so we can assume that maybe drone one is over here at this point. And um, let's see, where, where would that be? Well, that's where y is equal to zero. And uh, excuse me, x is equal to zero. And y is it like, I don't know. Y is, so I said five was here. I guess that's about eight. So you got <clears throat> something like here is a drone. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> Goodness gracious. Um, what did I say? Uh, zero, eight, and um, maybe it's at two meters. Yeah. So it's 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 shot a a grappling hook, and it's it's somehow f that drone has fixed its position over there because it it's got a claw hand it can attach to the wall with. All right. So anyway, it's got a, it's got a hook. It's putting this tension force over that way, right? And then <clears throat> you got another. Um, you got another drone over in this corner that's put a dra grappling hook, and that, that, the other drone's up here. And maybe it's at the point zero, zero. Let's say it's at three meters. Yeah, it's up there. Okay, so you've already got two, two drones that are um, pulling on this thing, right? So let me draw a picture. Here's the, the line. Here's the other line, right? And let's suppose that they can put, oh, I don't know, a thousand newtons of um, force. These are strong drones, all right? <clears throat> we live in a society that has, you know, a problem with evil flying monkeys for a period of time. The technology is advanced. You can imagine it. The question is, you have another third drone, right, of the same type. And where should you station it to... Um, put a, another grappling hook into the flying monkey as to immobilize it. You don't want to get too close. The sky, flying monkey also like spits acid, let's say. <laughs> All right. But you, you, you have cables which are immune to the acid, right? So the question is where would you put the other, you know, so what is, what is, what is this nonsense? Well, so what this nonsense is, is I'm trying to get you to think three-dimensionally. Where would you have to put another force on this point to make the sum of the forces zero, right? So what, what are the forces involved? Well, you have this tension like this. You have this tension like that, right? So let me say this is T1, this is T2. What are those tensions? T1 is 1,000 newtons times U hat. T2 is 1,000 newtons times U2 hat. And how would you find those unit vectors? How do you find vectors that point in the direction of the lines that I've drawn. How do you figure that out? So this U1 hat, your U1, you could say, is going from this point, which is 251, to that point, which is there, 0A2. So the, the displacement vector from here to here is exactly minus 2. Um, 8 minus 5 is 3. 2 minus 1 is 1. So this is the displacement vector from the flying monkey to the drone. Normalize that. Divide by its length, you have the unit vector, right? So this makes u1 hat, what is it? 1 over the square root of what? 4 plus 9 plus 1 minus 2, 3, 1. So there you go. That's the unit vector that you put here. That gives you the three-dimensional formula for the tension that pulls that way. And you can do the same thing over here. You just take, to find u2, you do this minus that, which is, in this case, minus, um, minus 2, minus 5, 3, uh, minus 1 is 2, yeah? So u2 hat would be 1 over the square root of what? 4 plus 4 is 8, plus 25 is 33. And so there you go. There's the unit vector that points in the direction of 2. Once you have that, you have stone cold formulas for, you know, the, uh, the, the these should be vectors, right? For the, for the tension put by the two different drones. And then you can ask the question, where do I put a third drone in order to cancel out the forces? Yeah. Is there an answer would be a one axis, right? Yeah, there may not be one answer here without 
putting more constraints. Well, no, I, I think I think in this case you have what's that? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that it also has a thousand newtons of force. It's grappling hook, and the the thing is, the sum of the tensions has to be zero to immobilize the monkey. We are, um, we're assuming the monkey's sitting on a table so we can neglect the force of gravity, all right? So just to make it slightly easier. Otherwise, we'd have gravity, and then we'd have to cancel that out with the tensions as well because you'd have to be holding the monkey up. But I think then, see this? If this is the case, if there's nothing else, or hey, even if there's gravity, this, is, this problem's easier. This problem's easier than your homework, why? Why is this problem easier than the homework problem? I didn't force you to put the third drone on a plane. See, the third drone can be anywhere, and in this case, you know, it would just be minus T1, minus T2, but you've, you've got explicit formulas for T1 and T2. Anyway, I think I'm out of time, but I just, these are ideas you can use to solve that tent point pull problem, yeah? You can think about tension as three-dimensional in a sense.